Hi, this is Bree from Part-Time Pilot. There is no better way to wake up in the morning of a flight than with clear skies and a cup of hot, delicious coffee. And there is no better coffee than coffee straight from Nicaragua. And there is no better coffee for pilots than twin engine coffee. That's why I bought a custom pod for my Keurig and Nespresso machines and a coffee grinder just so that I could grind my own fresh Nicaraguan coffee beans from Twin Engine Coffee. It's so much better than those stupid K-cups or K-pods or whatever you call them. But right now you're probably like, why are you telling us about coffee? Well, it's because not only is it aviation-themed coffee straight from Nicaragua, but it's also coming from a great cause. Rather than taking all of the coffee beans out of Nicaragua to package and sell elsewhere, Twin Engine Coffee is headquartered in Nicaragua where they have created jobs for local community and have a mission to help reduce local poverty. So if you're a pilot and you like coffee, head over to TwinEngineCoffee.com PTP or with the link in the show notes to order fresh whole bean Nicaraguan coffee straight to your home today. Hey, what's up, pilots? This is Nick. I wanted to take a second and talk about the Ultimate Private Pilot Test Prep book. Now, we don't have a ton of reviews yet on Amazon, but a lot of people have gotten it, and we have a lot of good feedback from it. And the reason why is because it blows out all those other test prep books out of the water, right? If you've gotten a test prep book before, it's got a bunch of FA written test questions. It's good for that. It's good for that rote memorization, practicing those test problems and stuff. But if you want to learn beyond that, it might have some bullet point summaries of some of the subjects. It might tell you some tips on multiple choice test strategies, but that's about it, right? So what if you want to learn this stuff at a fundamental level? What if you want to go deeper on any of these topics because you're just not getting these topics? And the reason I made this is because we don't have anything physical. And I myself am someone who really likes to study with something physical in my hands. I like to take it with me to the beach, to the park, when I'm traveling, whatever. So I wanted to make a book, but then I wanted to make a book unlike any of the other books. So that's what I did with the Ultimate Private Pilot Test Prep. So how is it different? Well, it's got all those test questions just like the other books. It covers every single subject just like the other books, but it breaks things down and explains all the concepts in simple English. And then you add in diagrams and visual aids that those books do not have. And then you also add in QR codes. You know those little QR codes that you scan to bring up a menu that came around during COVID? So yeah, you can do that with your mobile device, your iPad, whatever, and it'll bring up a video lesson on what you're watching. We also have a bunch of QR codes in there for free downloads as well as free practice tests that come with the book. So it's on Amazon. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's only $37 and it's got literally everything you guys that's why it's the ultimate test prep book it's the best bet you can get for one single book when you're studying for your private pilot test so check it out hello welcome I don't know why I said it like that, but (laughs) welcome in to the Part-Time Pilot Online Ground School, our audio ground school podcast. Sorry, I'm all over the place today, but welcome in. And today's exciting because we're starting sort of the second half of the online ground school with section 10 on human factors. If you're following along, again, go to step one, private pilot lessons of your, you know, the step one course of your ground school membership and go to section 10 and that's on human factors. Just to give you a little sneak peek into what we got on the second half is then we got section 11, weight and balance, section 12, cross country planning, section 13, before takeoff procedures, section 14, aircraft airport operations, section 15, performance and ground reference maneuvers, section 16, now navigation, section 17, emergencies, and section 18, next operations. We'll also have maybe a bonus episode on the next steps for you after your ground school. So a lot left to cover. We've already covered a lot. This is a lot to do. So take it one day at a time. And in today's episode, we're going to get into probably the first three lessons of section 10. And that's going to be lesson one on supplemental oxygen. So there's rules and regulations around when you got to have supplemental oxygen, you know, breathing mass with with oxygen o2 in your aircraft and then lesson two on hypoxia what the heck is that and then lesson three hyperventilation some sort of medical conditions and phenomena that pilots can be subjected to that are a really really big deal so we're going to talk about that and that's why they're required for us to learn about it because it's really important stuff 
All right, so without further ado, let's go to lesson one on supplemental oxygen. There is one more sort of rule of the airways. We've kind of spaced out some rules and regulations. We talked about like aircraft speed limits and seatbelts and harnesses, some of those rules and regulations. And I saved this one for this section on human factors because it's very connected to the things we're going to talk about like in the next lesson called hypoxia. So supplemental oxygen is one more rule of the airways that must be mentioned and talked about. This rule relates to the use of supplemental oxygen. As we know and we'll discuss in more detail, the oxygen content diminishes with increasing altitude. Furthermore, the diminishing oxygen can have an extreme effect on a pilot's ability to safely operate an aircraft. And that's, again, we'll talk about that in sort of the next lesson or two. Therefore, the following rules have been put in place by the FAA. When flying above 12,500 feet MSL for more than 30 minutes, supplemental oxygen must be present and used by the required minimum flight crew, which obviously includes pilots. So above 12,500 feet for more than 30 minutes, supplemental oxygen must be present and used by the minimum required flight crew. The next one, when flying above 14,000 feet MSL, so now we're up to 14,000 feet MSL, supplemental oxygen must be present and used by the required minimum flight crew for the entire duration of flight at these altitudes. So if you're between 12,500 feet MSL and 14,000 feet MSL for more than 30 minutes, then you got to use supplemental oxygen if you're the pilot or the flight crew. If you're above 14,000 feet though, you have to use the entire time. So you can't wait for 30 minutes. So what this means is like if you if you just go over, you know, some clouds for 12,500 feet and you know you're only going to be up there for 10 or 15 minutes or so, you are not required until you've been there for more than 30 minutes to start using that supplemental oxygen. However, I would recommend having supplemental oxygen if you're flying at those altitudes, because as we'll get to in hypoxia and carbon monoxide poisoning lessons, we'll talk about how the effects of lack of oxygen can start at way lower altitudes. So if it were me, I have personal minimums that are lower than the FAA's minimums of 12,500 feet for 30 minutes. So, but anyways, I digress. All right. So we're at 12,500 feet for more than 30 minutes. You got to have, you and the crew have to have supplemental oxygen it has to be present and used when you're up there for more than 30 minutes. And then above 14,000 feet, you got to use it the whole time. So the whole time you're above, anytime you're above 14,000 feet, you and the crew have got to use it. And then when flying above 15,000 feet, MSL supplemental oxygen must be present for each and every occupant. That's passengers and crew. So if you're thinking, well, what is supplemental oxygen? Well, it can come in many forms. If you're just like a private pilot, general aviation, you'll find these in little canisters, little like, you know, breathing masks in these canisters that they sell at, at pilot shops and stuff like that. Or that you might buy if you're like a high altitude hiker, you know, you're going up to Everest or something similar to that. And so you'll want to make sure you have enough for, for the amount of time that you're going to be above those altitudes. And that's something you would get if your cabin is not pressurized. Now, if you're wondering, well, we fly at like 40,000 feet on these jet airliners when I fly to New York. That's because the cabin is pressurized and they're pumping in oxygen into the cabin and they're doing it and they have regulations for how they have to pressurize the cabin. And so that is basically how they provide the supplemental oxygen. If that pressurization were to fail or anything else, that's when those oxygen masks drop down and then they have that secondary use of oxygen that you put the mask over yourself. So that's how they do it on like commercial flights. They pump in the oxygen into the entire cabin because the cabin is pressurized. If you were to do that in your general aviation aircraft, the oxygen was would just go straight out out of the window out of the little nooks and crannies because it's not a pressurized vessel right so that's why you bring the mask and a separate can of oxygen if you're general aviation pilots so that's what supplemental oxygen is and that is where and when you got to use it so i have a nifty little diagram that shows an aircraft at different altitudes you know the different altitudes that we talked about and when they are they require the use of supplemental oxygen so go and check that out if you're in the online ground school and that is it for supplemental oxygen let's move on to the next lesson on hypoxia as the pilot in command it is critical to make sure that you are in a fit state to fly this includes many factors that we're going to discuss here in the human factor section but it is largely up to you never take any risks when flying if you feel off for any reason do not fly there's another thing that we'll get into some tools that you can use to sort of assess yourself and make sure that you are not putting yourself in a dangerous condition to fly. And I kind of also add another rule to that. I call it the rule of three. Basically, if 
any, and it, it could be the smallest thing, but if there are three sort of things that don't feel right to me before a flight, then I cancel the flight. Let's say that I don't feel good. Let's say I have a little bit of a stuffed up nose. Okay, there's thing one. Thing two is there was something wrong with the aircraft that needed fixing on my pre-flight. There's things two. And then thing three would be like, the weather is unexpected. There's a thunderstorm nearby that wasn't expected. That would be thing three. And I'll be like, all right, flying gods, not today. I'm not, I'm not going to do it today. So that's another kind of thing. But we'll get into a more you know scientific self-assessment that the FAA prescribes to in a little bit. But just wanted to mention that, hey, before before we start talking about these medical conditions, it's really largely up to you. The FAA is going to teach you about this stuff and they have requirements on like supplemental oxygen, but a lot of the stuff they don't have requirements for. So it's really up to you to keep yourself safe and make sure that if you feel off for any reason that you don't put yourself in danger. So what is hypoxia? Hypoxia is the lack of sufficient oxygen in the blood, tissues, and or cells in order to maintain normal bodily functions. There are four types of hypoxia. There's hypoxic hypoxia, hypemic hypoxia, histotoxic hypoxia, and stagnant hypoxia. So we'll go over each one of these and tell you kind of what you need to know about each of them. Hypoxic hypoxia is hypoxia due to high altitudes and a decrease in oxygen within the atmosphere due to air density. So all these hypoxias are when you don't have enough oxygen in your blood. So you don't have enough oxygen in your blood, your tissues, your cells. So when your heart's pumping your blood through all that, really one of the main purposes is to pump oxygen throughout your body and to get to oxygen all these cells in your body because they need oxygen to work and survive and all that stuff and keep you working and surviving. So that's sort of the main point of it all. And hypoxia is when you don't have enough oxygen. So you know, that cause of not having enough oxygen could be one of several things. And that's where these different hypoxias come into play. So hypoxic hypoxia is when you are high altitude. So there's a decrease in oxygen content due to these high altitudes and the, the limited, the lack of air density, the small air density. So just like when you are in a plane and the performance of your airplane goes down with low air density, because again, the oxygen is less, right? So when, when you have a low air density, the air is less dense coming into your engine. So you actually have to lean the fuel mixture to adjust for that, or else your fuel will be way too much for the amount of oxygen coming in. Sort of the same thing, right? Your personal performance of your body is going to be affected when you don't have enough oxygen at these low densities at high altitude. All right, so that's hypoxic hypoxia. Hypemic hypoxia is caused by carbon monoxide poisoning, anemia, disease, or blood loss. Now, carbon monoxide poisoning is the most common one, but also anemia, disease, and blood loss are also types of hypemic hypoxia. Hypemic hypoxia occurs when blood is unable to carry enough oxygen, and this is by a process called hemoglobin transport to the cells. So your heart's pumping your blood, and blood carries the oxygen via hemoglobin transport to your cells, and that keeps you alive and thriving. So there's things that can block that. Carbon monoxide is one of those, anemia, disease, and blood loss. And we'll get more into carbon monoxide poisoning because it is the most common hypemic hypoxia and it's a common situation for pilots, unfortunately, because some of the systems that we deal with that can give us carbon monoxide poison. All right, so that is hypemic hypoxia. Histotoxic hypoxia is the inability of the body to use oxygen due to alcohol consumption and other drugs. So the oxygen might be present, but it might not be able to be used by your cells. So the whole thing is we need oxygen to get to the cells and the cells to use the oxygen. So we could not have any enough oxygen because we're at high altitudes and that would be hypoxic hypoxia. Or the transfer of oxygen to our cells might be stopped by hypemic hypoxia or the inability of the body to use the oxygen due to alcohol or drugs could be another reason, and that is called histotoxic hypoxia. So I don't know if you've ever had a few drinks on like a commercial flight and seen that it hits you harder. That is kind of basically, you're a little bit hypoxic because although they pressurize and fill those cabins with oxygen, it's still at a much lower pressure and less oxygen content than you're used to at sea level. So you're a little bit hypoxic, and if you then add alcohol to that and get a little drunk, now you throw in some, so you got some hypoxic hypoxia, now you got some histotoxic hypoxia, and that's going to really hit you hard, and you're actually kind of experiencing some hypoxia. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I think that's what's going on, until I understand it. If there is a doctor or a medical professional out there that thinks I got it wrong, please reach out and, and let me know. But 
I think that's why, you know, you have a couple drinks in an airplane and you're like, whoa, it feels like I had like 50. <laughs> Anyways, that's histotoxic hypoxia. The last one is stagnant hypoxia. Stagnant hypoxia is oxygen deficiency in the body due to poor blood circulation and can be caused by excessive G-forces or cold temperatures. So this is another one. Like if you are flying a fighter jet and you just have you're maintaining like excessive g-forces you can actually like limit basically those g-forces are so high that the, the blood can't be circulated or transferred and so you're not transferring these g-forces are literally stopping your body from transferring oxygen to your cells and that would be stagnant hypoxia you could also get that in really cold temperatures right you're, if you're really really cold your blood's going to slow down and you just you're not going to get enough oxygen to your cells because it's just so cold and so slow right when when things get cold they they slow down a liquid slow down and they want to freeze so yeah that's some crazy stuff but that hopefully that one doesn't happen to you because that would be scary stuff they're all scary but uh, that one's the most rare i would assume but it's definitely something that can happen symptoms of hypoxia include euphoria headache impaired judgment drowsiness dizziness numbness and tingling in the fingers and toes if any symptoms of hypoxia are encountered, a pilot should immediately descend and slow their breathing rate. Descending to lower altitudes will increase the oxygen content in the air, and slowing your breathing rate means you will require less oxygen and it is a good stress management technique. So that's that's the lesson on hypoxia. What it is, what is it that you have to remember out of all of this? Well, you want to know the definition of hypoxia. That's a lack of sufficient oxygen in the blood, tissues, and cells to maintain normal bodily functions. You're probably not going to be asked on the FA written what the four types are, but you might be asked about one or two of them, probably hypoxic hypoxia or maybe histotoxic hypoxia. I think I've seen, I don't think I've seen stagnant or hypemic hypoxia, but I would think for the check right oral, it's good to know all four and what they are caused by. So that's hypoxic hypoxia, you know, high altitude, low air density, hypemic hypoxia, that, you know, limiting blood carrying oxygen to the cells, that's carbon monoxide, anemia, disease, or blood loss. Then you got histotoxic hypoxia, it's making the body body unable to use the oxygen due to alcohol or drugs and then the stagnant hypoxia caused by you know poor blood circulation which is caused by like g-forces or cold temperatures and then maybe remember some of the symptoms you can kind of think of it's very similar to like being too drunk right uh it's euphoria headache impaired judgment drowsiness dizziness numbness tingling in, in the fingers and toes so you basically just you start to lose all control and you can even pass out that's what I remember. I remember some of the symptoms. I remember the four types. And I remember what it is exactly that hypoxia does. All right. So that's hypoxia. Let's move on to the next lesson on hyperventilation. All right. We're on lesson three of section 10 on hyperventilation. This is going to be the last lesson we cover on this episode. And then we'll get going on ear and sinus concerns in the next episode. So hyperventilation occurs when you are experiencing emotional stress or tension, fear, anxiety, or pain in which the respiratory rate is abnormally increased such that there are vast changes in the levels of oxygen, O2, and carbon dioxide which is CO2 in your blood. The primary effect to those suffering hyperventilation is a significant loss of CO2 in the blood. So I'm going to restate that because I know that one is asked on the FA written. The primary effect to those suffering hyperventilation is a significant loss of CO2 in the blood. During hyperventilation, your breathing rate and depth of breathing will increase, which increases the amount of CO2 leaving your body, depleting your CO2 levels, although the CO2 may already be at a reduced level in your blood. This results in excessive loss of CO2 and can cause rapid breathing, decreased visual acuity, decreased judgment, headaches, weakness, drowsiness, and even unconsciousness. Each of the above mentioned symptoms Symptoms is not something any pilot wants to experience while operating an aircraft. If hyperventilation is suspected, the pilot should attempt to control breathing by reducing the rate of breath and breathing in 100% oxygen O2 if available. Since hyperventilation has similar symptoms to hypoxia, it could be mistaken for hypoxia and breathing O2 helps reduce the symptoms of both. So I actually had a doctor comment on sort of this information that I had in here. Now this information comes from the FAA. That's why I put it 
it in here. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not trying to give out medical advice and put someone's life in danger. That's why I stick to what the FAA is saying. And the reason why they say, you know, breathe in O2, a lot of people might say breathe in a, a paper bag. That's another thing that might work. But the FAA subscribes to because if you're just a pilot by yourself, you have no medical experience or whatever, you can't really diagnose yourself. And because the symptoms of hypoxia and hyperventilation are so similar, right? And decreased judgment, visual acuity, headaches, weakness, drowsiness, you know, they're, they can be very similar. So if you don't know what it is you're experiencing, O2 kind of helps with both of those. So that's why they sort of prescribe that. But the real key for hyperventilation, if you know it's hyperventilation, is reduce the rate of breath and try and get CO2. So that's why a bag, breathing into a bag is also a useful way to replenish the CO2 in your body. But really just calming down and making sure you're not just doing that, you know, that the really quick breathing, slowing yourself down and doing one of these techniques that the FAA suggests. A slow controlled descent should also be made to increase the amount of O2 in the atmosphere for you to breathe. So, okay, again, disclaimer, I'm not a medical professional. I get these tips and suggestions from the FAA or the FAR AIM. So you can check those sources. And if you are a medical professional and you have any other tips, I would love to hear them because we always want to make this lessons as informational as possible. All right, so let's kind of review hyperventilation. It is those suffering hyperventilation are suffering from a significant loss of CO2 in the blood, right? When you're hyperventilating, your breathing rate and depth increases rapidly, depleting CO2 levels in your blood. And that can cause rapid breathing, decreased visual acuity, so you can't see, decreased judgment, Judgment might make, start making weird decisions because you're not getting that stuff in your brain. Headaches, drowsiness, weakness, and even unconsciousness. So similar to hypoxia, a little bit different. You know, that rapid breathing is a little bit different. Maybe that, that loss of vision, although I've heard people with hypoxia kind of getting that too. And then even high consciousness. So very similar sort of symptoms. So again, that's why they say, you know, you want to get some O2 in your body or breathe into a bag and reduce your breathing rate. All right. So that's kind of hyperventilation right there in a nutshell. This has been a pretty quick episode, but that's okay. We're back from, you know, our halfway break. So we want to kind of ease back into it a little bit. And in the next episode, we'll get going on lesson four of section 10 on human factors, which is on ear and sinus concerns. Then we'll probably talk about motion sickness and even lesson six, spatial disorientation, because those two are also pretty, they're very similar. So, and then maybe we'll get into lesson seven, carbon monoxide poisoning. So, all right, everybody, thank you for listening. And until next week, keep up studying, fly safely and enjoy it. I'll talk to you then.